Ah, good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew. Um, and I've been preaching this month. Those of you who've been here in this month will know that this is, in fact, my last sermon. Um, I have been announcing that, uh, Juliet, you know, you have already heard three times. <laughs> some of you are used to this information, others are not. I've um, been telling some of you for a long time. But anyway, I have been announcing it uh, the last three weeks, but the Lord has led Sarah and Levi and I to take a sabbatical for next year. Um, I'm finding it awkward to talk about it because I don't have a solid plan or a solid, this is what's going to happen and this will happen and then that will happen. Um, all we know is that we sense God calling us to take it from December. Um, yeah, what it, what it'll be, we're not 100% sure yet. The practicalities thereof is, are that we will rent out our house. My work has given me a sabbatical for a year. Um, and we will live rent-free in the Eastern Cape in an old laborer's cottage in the felt or a boutique hideaway in a private game reserve, depending how you spin it, um, <laughs> depending who you ask. <laughs> But we'll be taken care of there. Um, yeah, so it's mixed emotions, obviously, excitement, anticipation. I don't know, the best way I can describe it is that it's almost like when God says to Abraham, pack up your things and go from here to a place that I will show you. Okay? Which place? No, I will show you. I will show you the place once you on your way. So... Yeah, it's mixed emotions, it's excitement, it's trepidation in many ways. As I say, there's not a big, big thought out plan. I've got the first three months sort of figured out maybe. But yeah, where it'll go, we're not sure how long. We don't know. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here and preach this last sermon. I preached my first sermon here about six years ago on worship. I've been in this congregation for 12 years, um, doing this and that, various teams and so on. But yeah, what a privilege. I think also, I must just say, in her absence, my wife is not here, but I, I do also want to thank her. Maybe she'll, I think she'll probably listen to this recording, give me some feedback. But, uh, <laughs> but I must thank Sarah. Um, she hates being at the front. She cannot stand public speaking. She can't even bring herself to do announcements. It's just the worst thing for her. Okay, so that's fine. There's grace for that. But how she covers me in me standing here um, is, a, is special. It takes a lot of work to preach to make sure I don't get up here and tell you a bunch of rubbish, okay? So I have to put in some hours to make sure I know what I'm going to say. Um, but what that means practically is Sarah looks after Levi the whole week. She, then on Saturdays when I'm preparing, she looks after him. On Sundays when I'm preaching, she's looking after him. Um, and she, she covers me in so many ways and enables me to do these things that I delight in so much. So, even though she's not here, I'm thanking her and I'm acknowledging her before you so that you also may know how these things go. <clears throat> okay. I've been preaching through John 4. The first sermon was on living water. The second sermon was on worship. There are no slides, so you're just going to have to listen to the scriptures and listen to what I'm saying. Um, and today I'm speaking about heaven. So I called the sermon series Conversations Through John 4, which um, sounded very hua -hua ostentatious, but it is a conversational passage of scripture. And I feel like we've, I've just been preaching sermons on clarification, maybe, is, is the best way I can sort of think about it. You know, we clarified in the first sermon that the living water that Jesus speaks of to the woman at the well is the Holy Spirit. Okay, There's a concrete link between the Holy Spirit and the living water. It's not a mere spiritual blessedness or some kind of Zen or some kind of great feeling about your spirituality. It's the living water is the Holy Spirit, okay? You can catch up on that sermon. And then we looked at spirit and truth worship, which is the next phase of Jesus' conversation with the woman and what that means. Um, and, and, and what worship is. We spent a lot of time looking at, at musical worship last week because it's a massive component, right? We just did it for about 40 minutes. Um, what's the deal with that? I won't go into all of it now. 
But we saw that worship engages our bodies because the spirit tabernacles in us. Our bodies have a response when we worship in spirit. Okay. Uh, the tagline there was not, have you tried this move, but have you been moved? Okay. There are physical expressions in worship. And when we see God, he moves us to bow, to clap, to sing, to shout. Um, and that's really what he desires, worshipers. So today I'm going to preach about heaven. I'm going to say up front, I'm going to say some things that uh, would have offended me, or not offended, I'm, I'm not yet to offend anyone. It's, there are thoughts that are thought-provoking that might provoke some, like, no, Matthew, you're losing the plot here. Um, heaven, heaven is sometimes difficult to speak about because of our preconceived ideas, yet it is something we should talk about, isn't it? If we are going to dwell with Christ in heaven for all eternity, shouldn't we think about it, what that means? Um, there's a common saying about people, uh, accusing people of being so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. C.S. Lewis responded to that thing saying, well, if you look at history, the people who've brought about the most change for the benefit of others have been those who were heavenly minded. It was precisely because they were heavenly minded that they lived the way they did and gave the way they gave. Right? You can be heavenly minded in a way that's avoidant. You kind of just not liking to deal with reality and so you imagine possibly some other realm. Um, that's the wrong view. And that's, you'll do that if you'd have a bad view of heaven. But there's an engaging where you understand eternity, you understand the nature of heaven that causes you to engage, in fact, even better in earthly life. So what did these heavenly minded people think about that made all this difference? Were they thinking about floating on a cloud, singing for eternity? Could that be what that motivated them? Is that a strong enough motivation, the idea of a perpetual church service? Or were they trying to do good so that they could get in to heaven, right? If I may quickly preach the gospel, yeah, or just in summary form, we understand that our good works don't get us to heaven, right? Some, some of us, um, I must also say, there are general senses of heaven or the afterlife. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about heaven. Heaven is a specific place, as we will see. As specific as hell is a specific place. Uh, I'm not talking about general notions of the afterlife. I'm talking about Jesus, who made us for a place, and he's the king of that place. We were made for a place, and we were made for a person. We were made for heaven, and we were made for Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> we, do, we cannot earn our way there. Many people will live a life of good deeds and expect God to reward them with heaven for their nice lives. Gospelly speaking, gospelly, that's not how it works. Jesus finishes the work. In summary, we have a debt of sin. We are under a penalty for that sin. Jesus does the work to redeem us from that sin. So our spending eternity with him is contingent upon our receiving his offer of eternal life with him his offer of forgiveness our saying yes lord we are sinners we receive your atonement your forgiveness for us right sarah could no more live a life of happy marriage with me without saying yes to my offer of marriage if i say will you marry me she walks away and never answers will we have a marriage for life that's happy right it's contingent upon a response so so, I mean, we all encounter it in, in, in various ways. Everyone's got a thought about heaven or an idea about heaven. I'm hoping to clarify it this morning. So we know it's not, it's not everyone's default destination. It's not some happy place. It is very happy, but people will speak a better, a better place. What does a better place mean, right? For Christians, I'm going to tell you what it means. Okay, right. So, did these people who made all this difference see something more? Is there more to see than simply trying to get in or thinking that we'll float around formless, somehow worshipping and singing? Last week we looked at spirit and truth worship. We all know that in heaven we will see him as he truly is and we will worship. We will not cease to exist or just go into a sleep state full of nice dreams. But if we say that we'll worship and then conclude that it's going to be one long singing service, well, then we show a very shallow understanding of worship. Or perhaps it's because we think of heaven as one long church service or one long sing-along that we think that only this part that we did now is worship and the rest of life is sort of up to us. And we don't consider the rest of life as an act of worship. 
It's either a misunderstanding of worship or of heaven that came first and led to the other one. That we will sing and clap and bow and shout and express musical worship in heaven, we know. We looked at this last week and you can read through Revelations. It's what the people are doing in heaven. Singing with a loud voice. But we also saw that Jesus' words about worship in spirit and in truth were building upon his words about the living water as the gift of God in John 4. And that the living water is the person of the Holy Spirit himself taking up residence inside our persons. It is a mystery, but it's true. Paul asks the Corinthians, do you not know that your body, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God? Jesus said to the woman at the well that worship neither takes place on this or that mountain, but that it happens in the lives of believers indwelt by God himself. And surely the temple and the spirit who occupies it are to be in a practical, everyday unison and alignment for there to be worship. That's why Paul, in his letters to the Corinthians, is asking whether they know and understand that these two are bound together, the Holy Spirit and your body, and then says that surely the temple of God cannot be joined to a prostitute or a brothel or any other kind of thing that your body desires. He says, no, there must be a unity. There is a unity, and these two must be in agreement. <clears throat> can't have the body doing one thing and then saying, well, in my inner person is another thing. That's why the New Testament speaks about presenting your bodies and all that you do in and with it as worship to God in Romans 12. And goes on to say that even your eating and your drinking are to be to his delight and glory in the book of Colossians. So I'm just going to be mentioning the scriptures. You can just write them down and then listen to them and later you can go back to those scriptures. But if we know that that is what worship is now, i.e. your whole life lived as a response to God by the power of the Spirit, shall we then say that worship in heaven is a stripped down version that retains only the 10% of the singing? That somehow worship can be so multifaceted and actually glorious now in your lived life, but somehow in heaven we actually leave all that behind and we just sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah all the time we will do that we will do that but it's not all that we will do and on what basis do we do that i think so why i'm saying some of you are going to raise eyebrows and things now is because they are just suppositions that we have and assumptions whether we've learned it from movies or from philosophy or from other religions we all have ideas about heaven okay so i'm humbly putting a case before you today to reconsider that, okay. On what, why, where do our thoughts about it come from? If it is an immaterial, impersonal existence, as we sometimes are led to believe, what do we make of everything that the Bible actually has to say about where Jesus went? after his resurrection, what he told his disciples where he was going, what, or everything that the Bible has to say, that Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for us with many rooms. What of all the discussions that Jesus had on rewards? You know, you did this well on earth, therefore in heaven you will do this. You will be entrusted with this, okay? There's, there's, there's more to heaven than a, a sort of spiritual consciousness that's just there, okay? That is, a, that is an Eastern religion idea. It's not a biblical idea. All the words on ruling, reigning, administering, speaking, relating, recognizing, seeing, understanding, knowing, eating, drinking. And what of all the trees, the roads, the gold, the gardens, the cities, the animals, the very specific dimensions given to the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to the new heavens and the new earth? Shall we assume that these are all allegorical or metaphorical? If so, why? Why should we assume that all of that is just a picture of something else? They're oddly specific and detailed if they are only meant to be hints about some sort of immaterial, air quote, spiritual reality. And what about this? What about Jesus being resurrected by the power of God, right? Romans says the Holy, by the power of the Spirit, Jesus was resurrected. He resurrects, leaving behind an empty tomb. Read, he walks out in a body, feet on the ground in a body. He doesn't leave behind a corpse in the tomb and now the spirit, the hologram of Jesus is walking around. No, Jesus is in his body, okay? He resurrects like that. God resurrects him like that. Then he appears to his disciples. He says to Thomas, feel my hands. 
he explicitly says to them, I am not a ghost or spirit or apparition or image. Feel my hands. He walks with his disciples. John 20, he eats fish with them on the beach. This is his resurrected body. Then, Acts 1, he ascends up to heaven in his body. Not he sort of sheds it and it falls down there like a snake skin and then his spirit goes up. No, his body goes up, gets caught up in a cloud as his disciples look on. Like that alone already is actually quite confronting to our perception of heaven. I'll be honest, it's confronting to me. I, I, I struggle to get my head around it sometimes, but that's why I'm preaching this. Um, <clears throat> See, what we think about when we think about heaven has a huge bearing on how we approach and make sense of life on earth. When our expectation of heaven is as anemic as it so often is, then we don't understand how our lives on earth are worship. How is this meeting, this Excel spreadsheet, this parenting, this shopping list, this road trip, this meal, this celebration, conversation, this job, this rest, this holiday, how does that have anything to do with life hereafter. And we, we can't answer those questions for ourselves if we think heaven excludes all of those things. We can't link them. And when we don't have a sense of that, we think of these things as meaningless and we sort of make up our own way around all of these things. Scripture continuously points us to an eager expectation of heaven and all of those who have endured before us in the faith, as we look in the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11 verse 16 says they were looking forward to a better country and a citizenship. It said that God had prepared a city for them. It was prepared by him for them. They had something to look forward to. So what was it that enabled these prophets to like pour out their lives in the service of God? Um, we'll get to this later. Paul says, what profit is it if I face danger every day if I'm just gonna, if there's no resurrection of the dead? Okay, so in this short sermon, I'm not about to give you the meaning behind all the details of your life. I don't have time, or maybe even the wisdom to do that, but I'm gonna give you something for you to work it out. I also don't have time or the necessary skill to explain and unpack some of the more technical details about heaven now, heaven to come, the millennium, rapture, timelines, and all these other sometimes confusing things that we mostly just avoid. Maybe they are confusing sometimes if we, have, if we start from the wrong base. It's something called eschatology. It's a fancy word for saying how things will end. Okay, I'm not gonna unpack that now. But I'm hoping to give you a confident picture of how things will be. Okay, so that you can have a framework to work these things out for yourself. With the ultimate hope, my ultimate hope, is that you will have a richer expectation of heaven. Actually really looking forward to it and having also more consonance or harmony or integration between heaven one day, your life in heaven one day, and your life on earth now. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple of assumptions. I said earlier, if we were to assume everything is just metaphorical and so on, why? So I'm just going to say there's a guy who wrote a very good book, Randy Alcorn. I borrowed it from the library. It's been with me for two years. I will give it back before I go on sabbatical. <laughs> so you guys can also borrow it. Um, but he coined the term Christoplatonism. Okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's a fancy word, but it's all really just to say that Plato was a Greek philosopher, as you probably know. Greek philosophy has ideas. Christianity has ideas. You merge these two, you get funny ideas. He just gave a name to that called Christoplatonism. Okay? He says it's poisoned Christianity and it's blunting its distinct differences from philosophy and Eastern religions. You see, Plato claimed that reality is fundamentally something ideal or abstract. To think of spiritual realm in physical terms or to envision God's presence in the physical world was to do it a disservice. He considered the body a liability, not an asset. He said the body is a hindrance as it opposes and imprisons the soul. He had a saying called soma sema, which meant a body, a tomb. So the Greeks had, a, had, an, had an idea that the material world was bad spiritual, cognitive world, good, okay? And they, they cut these in half almost and divided them. Yet scripture always brings these together, the Holy Spirit living in a, rib, in a body, okay? We'll look at 1 Corinthians 15, which is one of the key scriptures. Paul does a detailed defense of the physical resurrection to the Corinthians who were steeped in this Greek philosophy of dualism. 
Now, these kind of things, um, Christ of Platonism or anything else like it, appear to take the spiritual high ground. Right? We can agree with that. or we, We've encountered that and we've felt that. The more spiritual and out there, the less, and the less concrete in here, oh yeah, the more holy, the more spiritual. That's obviously the higher view, right? So that's why it's difficult to sometimes preach something like this because people think you're just so worldly and, you, and you, you're just getting into funny stuff now. Often when you try and refute these false philosophies, they appear to be materialistic, hedonistic, or worldly. Literal interpretations of the Bible are seen as suspect. And allegorical and symbolic interpretations are deemed more spiritual and intellectually appealing. We can sometimes feel dis- depressed, unspiritual for not having this desire for an eternal church service. And we shouldn't. That's not what heaven is anyway. Randy Alcorn talks about our desire to eat gravel. We do not desire to eat gravel. Why? Because God did not design us to eat gravel. Trying to develop an appetite for a disembodied existence in a non-physical realm is like trying to develop an appetite for gravel. No matter how sincere we are and how hard we try, it's not going to work. Nor should it. His whole argument is that we made, right? If we're honest with ourselves, if I say heaven is one long church service like this, me standing there or someone else standing there, you guys just sit and listen, sing a bit. I don't know who's jumping out of their seat to be like, yes, that is what I want. Forever, forever, right? We only do it once a week and people are like, sure, Matthew, it's quarter to 11. (laughs) And we can feel depressed and unspiritual. We think, oh no, we're just not spiritual enough. Belief in and anticipation of heaven is not meant to be a nice auxiliary sentiment, but a central life-sustaining conviction. How can we have set our hearts on heaven, as scripture says, set your mind on things above the place where Christ is, How can we set our minds and our hearts on that if we have such a poor, impoverished theology of it? Okay, so I'm going to go into some scriptures. Your key scriptures here, if you want to write them down for later reference, are 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just naming the chapters, the verses, you'll find them. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, Revelations 21 to 22, Romans 8, uh, by extension Genesis 1 and 2, and then also 2 Peter 3. Okay, time is running out, but I'm going to try and get... To this. But before I go into the scriptures, then I'll say, what about the habit of allegorizing scripture? Oh yes, a tree is metaphorical, a river is metaphorical, a body is metaphorical, everything is metaphorical. Okay? That is a habit that we can do with scripture. And many, many theologians of the past have done that. Right? Thomas Aquinas, well known, whatever, viewed heaven as like just a burst of color somewhere. This quintessence, it was in something entirely other. We couldn't know it now. Okay? So there's this there's theological support and tradition for what I'm saying and what Randy Alcorn is saying and what we believe the Bible is saying is a poor view of heaven. Okay, But let's assume for a moment, even if we do want to allegorize all of scripture, let's put that on hold and let's say, let's assume that the resurrection from the dead is an actual bodily resurrection, as in your body comes out of the grave. Let's assume that when scripture talks about the new earth and the new heavens, it is real and physical. You can touch it and use it and be in it. Let's assume that heaven is tangible, earthly place inhabited by people with bodies, intellect, creativity, and culture building, relational skills. And let's assume that the physical heaven is God's plan and has been all along. Let's assume that's to be true. How would we want God to say it to us? How would we want God to let us know that that is what it is like? And how would that differ from what is actually said? Are you with me? Right? He's, he, he's communicated, God has communicated about heaven. We've said, oh, that's symbolic. I'm saying, okay, well, let's assume it's not symbolic and it's real. What words would you have used to prove to us that it's real? Would they not be very much the same words? A tree is a tree. A river is a river. Okay, let's go. 1 Corinthians 15 um, as I said, Paul is making this defense. And I think, I don't know if we'll get to all the scriptures, I'll just, just talk about them. But from verse 12, he says, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. 
we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we've testified about God that he did raise Christ. But if he did not raise him, then it's not true. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Um, then I'm going to skip a couple of verses. Um, down to verse 35. But someone will ask, okay, Paul, if the dead are raised, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? So Paul has just said, if Christ didn't get raised from the dead, salvation doesn't have its effect. Right? It says later that the sting of death is sin. Death came about because of sin in Adam. You pay the penalty of death. Right? The fact that you die is a result of sin. Jesus goes to the cross to bear the penalty of sin. He dies. He experiences the same result of sin. If he stays dead, has he won? Or is, still, is sin still on top? Sin is still on top because sin has achieved what it achieves. The death of Christ even. But God raises him. That's why Paul says, if Christ is not raised, then you are still in your sin. So he proves to them, okay? He says four times in a different way that denying the bodily resurrection of believers denies the bodily resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> so they say, okay, Paul, this is weird. How will it look then? Will it look like us? Will it not look like us? Will it look a little bit like us? But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish per person, he says. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. What you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body, body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. And then I'll skip a couple of verses, but he talks about the glory of different bodies, right? Animals, humans, the moon, the stars, they are all bodies of a form with a different glory. Verse 42, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Um, Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust, the second man from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as the man of heaven, so also are those who are heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Okay, so there's a lot of back and forth, but Paul is saying, like he says elsewhere, when we are raised, we will be like him. Right? We thought about Jesus' bodily resurrection now. He resurrected in a body. Uh, amazing body. Right? Because as he was appearing to his disciples, he actually also walked through the wall because all the doors were locked and he appeared to them. And they got a massive fright and said, this must be a ghost. How did you get in here? He says, no, I'm not a ghost. Okay, so Jesus' resurrected body, it was much better than the earthly body, but it was still a body. Whether we can walk through walls or not, I don't know. But your resurrection body will have a glory greater than the body that you have now, but it's still a body. Okay. God will change the bodies of believers to make them immortal and appropriate for their new imperishable existence. We have those contrasts. Incorruptible, sorry, sown corruptible, raised incorruptible. Sown immortal, raised mortal. Sown 
Sorry, wrong way around. So imperishable, raised in imperishable, sown in dishonor, glory, weakness, power, natural body, spiritual body. Spiritual body does not equal immaterial body, but it equals a body indwelt and animated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. In short, the language of a seed is what Paul uses. You think of a kernel of a milli. It's a small seed. You put it in the ground. It dies. It disappears. Right? You can't recover that little kernel that you put in the ground. But a new plant comes up. Way more glorious than that little kernel. Yet having some continuity. right? You see some of the same. You see little kernels on the milli. Or whether it's a poppy. The poppy seed is, is like about as big as a grain of salt. Goes into the ground, up comes a poppy bush, bearing poppies, which makes a pod, which bears more seed. So what, what comes up after the seed dies is way beyond what the seed was. But there is some continuity. That's really the essence of what I want to say here and what Paul is saying. There's continuity between the body that you see now and the body that will be resurrected. The Westminster Larger Catechism, which is one of our well-liked documents for the crystallization of orthodox doctrine, says, from 1647, the self-same bodies of the dead which were laid in the grave, being then again united to their souls forever, shall be raised up by the power of Christ. Westminster Conf Confession said, all the dead shall be raised up with the self-same bodies and none other. Okay, there's continuity. Now here, without getting complex, there's earth, then there's heaven one day, the new Jerusalem. There is the intermediate heaven, okay? We're not going down a rabbit hole now, but when people die now, their souls go up to God. Their bodies stay in the ground. Thessalonians 4, which we'll read now, comes, God comes with those spirits, right? Those bodies come up, and those of us who are left here are also changed and caught up in the air. Okay, you guys think I'm losing it now. Let's go. 1 Thessalonians 4. <laughs> the coming of the Lord. So the Thessalonians were grieving. They had lost some people, some family members, brothers, sisters. Paul says to them, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. He's using a euphemism there. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay, do you have the picture? There are people who have died. People who have died in Christ, their bodies are in the grave. Either still decomposing or eaten by worms or cremated. Whatever it is, their bodies have ceased to exist. Okay? Then... Their spirits are in heaven. That's what this passage is saying. And we can know that from other passages, right? There's recognition in heaven of people. Lazarus and the rich man, they saw one another across the chasm. They, they knew who each other was, okay? Jesus said to the thief when he died on the cross next to him, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. The thief's body stayed there. His spirit was that night with Jesus. Okay, but that's, that's the intermediate heaven because all the language of the new heavens and the new earth is about a return and a something more solid, something more material. Yeah, it's saying, if you are alive on the day when Christ comes back, you won't have gone under the ground. You'll be changed and you'll be caught up into the air with, with Jesus and all the spirits that he brought back that have just been reunited with their bodies. Okay? You guys all right with that? They, the, yeah. Paul says, therefore encourage one another with these words. If we don't have this understanding, we'll grieve as those who have no hope, just like the first century ancient Greeks. Death was very final. For Christians, death is not very final. And it's not 
the hope is, is, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what more to say except what if he's, if Thessalonians has just said about your, your body is going to be changed. Not going to be nothing. It's going to come back. Um, okay, time is, time is short, but we really looked at the clues about Jesus' body. So that's, there's continuity between our bodies now and our bodies then. Revelations 21 and 22 Jesus says, I'll quickly just read the first part. <clears throat> We're starting to look at the resurrected earth. Uh, where is it now? I'll just read the first part. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Then I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then later in Revelation 22, the angel takes John to see the, the new Jerusalem and he gives very specific dimensions of it. Okay, so new heavens and new earth. I'm gonna not read all the scriptures and I'm gonna tell you about them and what they say and then you can check it afterwards. But the new heavens and the new earth, right? We could easily allegorize that and say, okay, no, it just means something sort of new. Okay, but let's assume we've departed from that mindset and said, um, Okay, it is an actual physical world. And when I say physical, it, it's not earth as we know it now under the curse. Right? We, we've only seen earth under the curse. We, where it's like really hard to make a living. People die. Uh, life is really, really bitter actually. Once that poison is just spread out throughout our creation. The new earth is physical. We mustn't equate it to the bad side of the physical that we know here, but it is material. Just a quick one here, because I'm trying to get to continuity. So what do we do? Living in light of that, if it's a physical place, what is the nature of that physical place? Okay, Revelations talks about a city, it talks about rivers, it talks about a whole lot of things that if we are to assume that they are real, it's a real place, it's like a country, it's like a real earth that we're gonna go to. What does that mean for our lives now? Well, is the new heavens and new earth, does it mean newly created or just renewed and made new? People can't decide. There's a passage in 2 Peter 3 that talks about fire, right? So we, we assume that the earth is gonna be like torched and disappear and be gone forever. Then the new heavens and new earth, we either think it's gonna be an immaterial existence or if we abandon that, we say, okay, it's a new place. Long and the short, there are different words for exposed in that 2 Peter 3 verse 10 on the day of the Lord. The one means found, the other means burned up. Most manuscripts mean found, which means exposed. So the more likely fact is that the earth as we have it now is not annihilated, but it's actually transformed. And, and transformed by fire, right? Because the, the parts just before where Peter talks about the heavenly bodies dissolving in fire and everything, he talks about the flood. God judged the earth before with water. Okay, but it wasn't, that earth didn't go away. That earth is still this earth. In the same way that we are a new creation, right? We didn't disappear. When Juliet became a new creation, she didn't cease to be Juliet. She was a new transformed Juliet. Same for all of you. Okay, so, so the lang don't confuse the language. We must test it with the rest of scripture. The description of the holy city in the new Jerusalem has got dimensions there. Um, this is quite interesting. 12,000 stadia. Now you can say, okay, that's allegorical because everything's 12 in the Bible. Well, maybe. But if it's, if, it's, if it's actual, I mean, they could just have easily said 12 million or 12 something or just 12, right? But they said 12,000 stadia, which is equivalent to 2,200 2, kilometers. So the new city that John gets, sees when the angel shows to him is 2,200 kilometers Long, 2,200 kilometers wide, 2,200 kilometers high, okay? 2,200 kilometers is like driving from here to Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, or driving from here through to the top of Namibia, okay? It's really far. I think it's big enough to accommodate all the Christians um, in the world, especially if it's got that height as well, okay? So it's, it's nothing to God to create a tangible city big enough. <clears throat> Okay, now I'm gonna really have to find the nuggets here. <clears throat> As I 
Jesus said, the point that I want to make is about continuity. We know already from Scripture that there's continuity between our bodies. We can also readily see from Scripture that the new heavens and the new earth has continuity with the current earth and the current heavens, right? So what does this mean for our practical lives? Well, it should make us rethink what we do with life. As I said earlier, if you, if you think heaven is this vague existence, you, you just make life up for yourself. You can't figure out the meaning of these things. But if we can think that, okay, so I will die, I'll come back up with a body very similar, much better, it's eternal, and I'm going to a place that's also quite similar, but much better, there's no curse, there's no crying, there's no pain, there's no more tears, it is the ultimate existence. Well, then there's continue. If I'm the workmanship of God, if Ephesians says that you are the workmanship of Christ, if you see God as a someone with DIY, um, Stefan does woodwork. As a workman, you put wood together, you create something for a purpose, a table or a chair. We are God's workmanship. He knows what he's put into us in skills, passions, dreams, desires, all of those things. He's put that together. And if there's going to be likely continuity of that into eternity, what might we do with that now? And it's full of ruling, reigning. It says it will rule nations and, and, and ruling, we'd we be prone to think of, okay, so there's a king and he will have subjects. But if you think of the body, each one is the leader or rules in his domain, right? The foot rules the walking, the eye rules the seeing. Just like we will in the new heavens and the new earth, in different ways, in perfect symphony, not in competition, rule, right? According to the workmanship that God has put together in us. And rewards, right? Jesus talks about it all the time. Let's not make that merely metaphorical. He says, no, if you rule well now and steward well, I've got more for you to steward in eternity. And maybe you're stewarding now under duress. You're like, oh man, I just hate managing projects. Like me, I don't, I don't like managing projects. But God may redeem that. I am a project manager, right, in my day-to-day -day work. He can even redeem that and make that awesome. If I'm faithful with that, he might give me some nice projects to manage in heaven one day. <laughs> and I'll really enjoy it. We mustn't, we mustn't bring, yeah. As I said in, our, in, in the sermon last week, might it be that we would do many of the things that we're doing now only in a redeemed place, in a redeemed way, in a redeemed body. Okay, I think my time is up. Um, we're going to have communion just to close the service, but as I said, there's not enough time to fully unpack this, and I hope I haven't left you with more questions than answers, but we must think about heaven. We must think about it. If it is to be our eternal dwelling place, if, if the Bible has so much to say about it, it's a hope, right? Paul wrote it and he says, guys, don't grieve. He says you can grieve, but don't grieve as those who have no hope because you actually have hope. And this is the hope. Your body will be raised. And you will see those. You will meet those whom you've just lost. You'll see them again. You'll recognize them in heaven. You'll continue relationship with them. And you'll be with the Lord. Right? Jesus said, when, when, when Thomas touched him, he said, Lord, I believe he said, great Thomas, but blessed are those whom having not seen, have believed. All of us now carry that. We believe in Jesus, but we haven't even seen him yet. We don't even know how great that will be. We do not know how enrapturing that be, would be. So uh, when I talk about heaven as a, as a place where we do stuff and, and say maybe the idea of a long church service is, is too shallow, I'm not taking away from the worship that we will do of Christ. I'm only just fleshing it out a bit more, right? Okay. So my hope as we take communion, is that you have the um, people, um, the ushers can distribute the, the elements, as we call them. <clears throat> but my hope is that we would, would leave with an expectation of heaven and take these scriptures, search them out for yourself, read the book once I brought it back, and uh, yeah.